first of all, I kind of I want to start with words of gratitude. Mm -hmm. That's what first comes to mind <laughs> and heart as well. First of all, gratitude to this place uh, where I spoke for the first time three years ago, mm -hmm. almost to the day, on this very stage. And it was a special experience. The gratitude to all of you for being here. Mm -hmm. The gratitude, the special gratitude to the organizers. And it's a bit nostalgic. Uh, I feel a little, already a little nostalgic because I hear this is the last time that we are gathering that we are gathered in this room, in this place. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a special moment. Mm -hmm. And also gratitude to you, Adyashanti. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, you may not know that, but we met a while ago. So <laughs> <laughs> I first saw you speak two and a half years ago mm -hmm. uh, at, at a church near Lake Merritt in Oakland. Uh, beautiful place. Beautiful place. My friend Christina took me there, and I remember I was very giddy the whole time before the lecture. Kind of similar to how I am right now. <laughs> and, um, and then you came on stage, and, and you spoke, and I felt like you spoke directly to me because you were, um, your words resonated with the, the, what I was experiencing at that moment. Mm -hmm. And I, I was still in the phase of asking many questions. <laughs> so I was like, how is it possible that this guy knows what's going on inside of me? And, um, well, that might be one of the things we can yeah. talk about. Um, and then I started, I, I'm very textual, so I started reading your books, I watched you online, mm -hmm. and um, every time it res uh, the words resonated, mm -hmm. and uh, so I want to to say uh, it's very hard to in encapsulate with words, but I, I felt that there is there was this poetry, there was this poetry that um, of your teachings that very deeply uh, affected me. And I see it now even more clearly than before. And so I want yeah. to start by just yeah. saying a deep thank you from the thank bottom you. of my heart. Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. I, um, I did some research. And so I looked at some of, your, some of the stuff that Edward's done on the web. And if nobody's ever looked at, done a search on, on Edward through YouTube, and there's these wonderful YouTube clips. And it, it had this really curious effect on me is, I was always terrible at math, right? So I was sort of diagnosed dyslexic very, very young. And I overcame almost every sort of form, most forms of it, reading and all the rest, but I could never get past a very rudimentary kind of mathematics. And, it, it, and you became an example of what I've often said that I, that I really, really, one of the things I love most is, you know, when anybody who loves what they're doing, that they bring passion and heart and, and, and real, real love and, and joy to it. And I've been, you know, over the years of my life, I've been turned on to any number of things simply because somebody else was so deeply inspired and turned on and speaking from a place that was so meaningful, you know, I fell in love with, with history at one point because of a history teacher and literature from a literature teacher, people that were just, um, it's, a, it's a transmission in a sense, you know, joy and, and love and, and wonder is a transmission. And, and um, so I just want you to know that I, re I really caught that watching videos of you. I was like, wow, this is even for somebody that can barely get through multiplication. You know, <laughs> you know, my expertise starts at the most introductory to algebra course. It was, there's such a, uh, um, there's such a fascination to me. And I, and I think it really connects with one of the things I think what drew us both here was this, this sense of, of, uh, of love, 
mm. right? The, this sense of these two things, I think, that I sense that we both share, and probably most people in the audience share, it's probably why you're here, this great love of, this great love of, of wonder, of questions, this great, to, to, to deeply have this instinct alive in us, which I think many people here share, of wanting to not only understand ourselves or the world we're in in a really deep way, because I, I actually love the, the, also the sort of strictly intellectual pursuit of things. I, I'm always sort of educating myself as much as I can on a whole variety of subjects that I really love. But, um, but also, the, I think there's a connection of anybody who does anything extremely well they seem to always be connected to love and wonder. Just a, a wonderment at being. And to me, I think this is, for me, what spirituality really is. It's sort of a wonderment with, with the experience of being, of, mm -hmm. of existing, in, in any way that we want to approach that, you know. And I've often thought that as a spiritual teacher, in that domain, I always think that spirituality is really the place of where you explore the most fundamental, what I kind of call existential questions of being. Who am I? What is, what is the world? Where did this all come from? And it's, dawn, it's also dawned on me that this, these are also a lot of the same questions that people in many, many different pursuits outside of spirituality, scientists of all sorts, mathematicians of all sorts, physicists of all sorts. It's, it's interesting how we often share a love of similar questions. There's some way that they seem to be rooted within the structure of consciousness, this kind of wonderment, you know? Right. And, and the desire to experience what we know or what we think we know. You know, there's, there we may be convinced of the unity of existence, and it's, it's such a fascination, fascinating idea to, to contemplate and to live with. But I think most, most human beings within the structure of our consciousness also is this deep desire to, to experience these things. Mm -hmm. to experience, so, so which I, what I loved and what I saw of the work that you did on the videos, which also included a talk here, was the connection of the, the, the wonderment of intellect and the wonderment of experience, and not being satisfied with, with simply one part of that equation, wanting to experience these deep mysteries that we come upon. Right. And I think this is a lot of where, where these outlooks of, of the sciences that we often think, you know, that, that spirituality and science seem, can seem so divergent, but they're actually so often dealing with some really, they, they really cross over to fundamental questions and deep questions. Um, so I think this is where we, some place where I really felt a sort of real closeness and kinship with you because I, I caught that flame of joy and happiness and, and, um, and I loved the element that I think is also so important in spirituality of self-disclosure. Mm -hmm. You know, of, of disclosing, of bringing the inside in, up right. into awareness and not being either not being afraid of it or not being afraid that you're afraid of it. <laughs> exactly. Well, I would say, I, thank you, first of all, and um, I, it resonates what you're saying. I would say longing for the truth is what, yeah. is, there, there is that. And uh, scientists have that, or mm -hmm. th those scientists who are really passionate about those of us who are really passionate about the, the work we do. And so in the end, we are searching for the truth. The difference between, uh, I would say, spiritual pursuit and or what we usually call spiritual pursuit, because in the end, everything is the face of God, as you, know, you were mm -hmm. saying last night, and uh, uh, we just may not know that. Mm -hmm. 
but there is a difference, a seeming difference is that when we are on the spiritual path, it is understood that there is a lot, there is a lot of inner work that has to mm -hmm. be involved in the process. Mm -hmm. Whereas the way science is presented today, it um, usually eliminates the sort of first-person perspective. It, we talk about mm -hmm. Objective phenomena. Yeah. Subjectivity is sort of a bad. Uh, it's it's kind of banned. It's a bad it's a language. taboo, right? So, <laughs> yes. uh, luckily, yeah. we are now in the 21st century, almost uh, about 100 years after landmark achievements in science, which have shown to us that um, you cannot really disentangle the observer and the observed. Mm -hmm. I'm talking, of course, about quantum mechanics but also Einstein's relativity, where time and space are relative, mm -hmm. depending on the observer. Also, Gödel's incompleteness theorem in mathematics, which also shows that ultimately the observer is the one who writes the axioms. And the, the truth, in the end, is elusive. It cannot be captured by logical argument alone. Mm -hmm. So. All of that, as I see now, in some sense, are the hints to us, to scientists, that there is more. And in the end, you have to turn the gaze inside. Mm -hmm. to that, that truth you're longing for, mm -hmm. Edward, is not outside in, the, in, in, in building theories about those objects mm -hmm. in, in, in a so-called outside world. The truth is inside. And, um, what is interesting to me is the alchemy of that, of that process. Yeah. Uh, how do, how do you, does somebody like uh, Edward, a, yeah. a mathematician who spent so many years, you know, just mm -hmm. uh, working on these mathematics problems, and I loved it. It's not that I did it as a chore. Of, of course, there was that love, there was that passion, even if I did not fully recognize it as such. But it was focused on doing that, doing that, and becoming, achieving. I want, to, I want to become a professor. I want to become a member of the academy. I want to get an award. I want to get this and that. I want to prove that theorem so that my name will be written next to such and such. <laughs> OK. And then there is a switch. Oh, actually, um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm going, for, I'm, I'm driving forward when, in fact, I should back up. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And so what I've been contemplating recently is how does this alchemy, alchemy actually happens? Yeah. And so, so I can share my, my personal story, how it happened for yeah. me. One of the reasons why I was contemplating this is because I was asked to contribute a chapter to a book about AI safety, mm -hmm. artificial intelligence. So it's a book, it's an academic publisher, so it's a book, a very serious book about, for researchers in computer science, about how do we write programs so that our robots, so to speak, don't turn against us, <laughs> the way it is sometimes presented in sci-fi <laughs> movies and so on. Mm -hmm. There is actually a whole, a serious um, branch of computer science which is dealing with that. Mm -hmm. But my uh, contribution, I was asked specifically to write a contribution, uh, 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 kind of a, about a different dimension. Mm -hmm. And I called it the first person perspective. Mm -hmm. And in this contribution, which I just finished writing, I actually shared my personal story about how I, I came to sort of turning the gaze inside. Mm -hmm. And it happened because I was, I, I, the question that was really posed, which led me to that, was the question that there was, some, there was a child inside. There was a voice, there was a, there was a voice, but I couldn't hear or refused to hear it. There was a child inside. There were experiences in my life, in my childhood, of which I was not fully aware. Mm -hmm. And it came as such a shock. It came as such a shock that, uh, because if you ask me a few years ago, did you have a happy childhood? I would say, oh yes, you know, it's great. Everything was just just, uh, just rosy and fine. And yet there was this wounded child who was longing for my attention, for my love, mm -hmm. wanted to be held and nurtured. How, I was shocked by this. How could I not know? You see. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, then my first impression was my first. Um, question was, why did no, nobody tell me before? <laughs> you see, why didn't anybody tell me before? 
Then, uh, with more uh, maturity, shall we say, there is an understanding that maybe they did tell you, Edward, but you, you wouldn't listen. Yes. <laughs> right? So there is yes. this moment. There is this moment when it is being told, and it, I am willing to listen. Mm -hmm. But it makes me so, and uh, in fact, the first time I spoke here at Sand three years ago mm -hmm. was about that. It was actually still fresh in my mind. Yeah. Uh, that process just started of reconnecting. Mm -hmm. what, the way I see it um, now, um, and it's, of course, it's all a model, a particular model, a particular way we describe. This, the re reality is beyond all of that. But there were certain parts of me from which I was disconnected. Yeah. It was me, and yet I was not, I hadn't met them. Mm -hmm. And the reason I didn't meet them was because there were certain events that happened which were very painful. Mm -hmm. And I was not equipped yet as a child, we were, as children were not equipped to handle that kind of pain. So I was not a, equipped to handle that pain, so I was not able to accept what's happening. So, and that's what psychologists call dissociation, yeah. a splitting. Yes. That part of yourself kind of gets tucked Under, away. It, yes, the, it's kind of like the way I want to see it. It's almost like a, in terms of Jung's vocabulary of conscious and unconscious, yeah. sort of like an iceberg where you have a, above the water is the conscious, what we are aware, what is on the verbal plane, mm -hmm. and be, below the surface is that vast part. The other 90%. Yes, actually much bigger. <laughs> 90, maybe 90, 99.9, <laughs> you know, right? And so, so it's pushed in there. But it wants to come out. The child wants to come out. It's, mm -hmm. it's, and every opportunity he or she gets, he wants to let himself, herself know, known to the adult, yeah. Edward, right? Yeah. And so, but connecting to, so what I understood is that it's a kind of a catch-22 situation. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, I want to connect. Or we could say, well, why don't you go and connect? The point mm -hmm. is that to connect, you have to then take that pain that was refused yeah. in the first place. Mm -hmm. That's the means of the connection, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yes. It, 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 yes. And so then my conscious mind, of course, it's almost like there is a, there is a, there is a brigade mm -hmm. working 24-7 mm -hmm. trying to prevent me to connect, mm -hmm. because it says, we are just protecting you, Edward, because we don't want you to experience that pain, because who wants to get, experience pain? And yet, if I don't connect, my life is still incomplete. Mm -hmm. There is no wholeness yeah. that can be achieved or experienced fully. Life cannot be fully experienced. So I spoke about this at Sand three years ago, when it was still very fresh in my mind. And there were several children, actually. There were several boys who were neglected. And I felt so, one of the things, I felt ashamed, ashamed that for so many years, I kind of left them <laughs> on the battlefield mm -hmm. of life, like fallen soldiers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they were just waiting for me. Mm -hmm. And uh, so what I'm wondering is, in your experience, in your opinion, what I'm describing, is that something common, universal, perhaps? Yes, it's, it's yeah, it's, it's extremely, I don't know that anybody gets through, through childhood without having experiences that are, I mean, like, we're, we're very young, so we're kind of ill-equipped to handle some, some of the immensity of experiences we have, especially painful experiences, and so we do the best we can. We tend to try to tuck that, which is, which is too big for us, where we weren't capable of experiencing fully and deeply. We try to, you know, tuck it away, and it's unconscious. It helps us to get through that moment, helps us to survive and get along. And then there's those places that we keep tucked. So on a psychological dimension, I think it's, and I think anybody that really looks inside for very long, they're gonna find parts of themselves that they, as you wonderfully said, that they kind of left on the battlefield. You know, w wounded warriors that you kind of abandoned. But of course, it's, I think it's important to see that whenever, when we do that, we're simply doing the best thing that we could do at yes. the time. 
we weren't, we weren't adults. It's a defense mechanism, it's a total because otherwise defense. I could just die. Yeah. It has that was the alternative, to, to die completely right. or yeah. to die partially, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So that the one, the part which is alive, would continue. It's almost like, you know, uh, the, I leave this, the, the, the small one there to sort of fight the adversity, to, find, uh, to fight whatever, mm -hmm. you know, the intruders. And says, Edward, here, there's one horse. You have to get on that horse and, you know, gallop away. But come back. When you get stronger, when you get stronger, mm -hmm. come back and help me out. And yeah out of cap captivity, you yes. know what I mean? Yes, yes, and, and, and you know, there's a, there's a psychological domain of that which, you, which you've articulated really nicely, and I, I watched that talk that you did here. I, was, I found it very, very, very moving, actually. Um, it was really beautiful. If anybody hasn't seen it, I would recommend them to, to look it up. But there's something, there is, there is something of, a, of an equivalency to that that has to do with even these big, big issues in life that can and questions of life that can seem to be disconnected from the, you know, the, the intimacy of the experiences like you're talking about, you know? And yet, in a certain sense, when we're, when we're endeavoring to look into, inside um, to the, the deepest, deepest domain of our, of our identity, in a certain sense, we are, um, we are sort of rediscovering something that we turned away from. We did it without knowing it. And one of the primary reasons that we do it, even, even beyond what happens in the difficulties of life and the challenges of life and all that, but for, for sort of the, 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 the most real and most true subjective experience of our being, because of course in spirituality, what we're exploring is the the, the, deep, the, the most subjective experience of being, because of course that's all we have, is, an ex, is a subjective experience of being. And things like awakening and enlightenment, in a certain sense, it's a rediscovery. It's, it's not finding something or creating something that wasn't there, but it's a finding something that we kind of turned away from. And it, we turn away from it with, as far as I can see, with literally the dawning of self-consciousness around a year and a half to two and a half years old, when we start to get self-conscious, we start to become fascinated with this, what starts out to be an amazing capability. The amazing capability to, to kind of go look in the mirror and go, me. Mm. Have you ever seen a little, a little child, the first time they can look in the mirror and they recognize themselves? A six-month-old just looks in the mirror and they're just, you know, it's all just one big undifferentiated goo. <laughs> but the first time you can go, me, you, they are excited, right? They've made a discovery and then they have this name for it and then they just start, you just start. It starts out as a nice game. <laughs> it's a wonderful game, yeah, and, and it's... You know, and then of course it, it's, it, all, it also depends on our ability to conceptualize. Right. It's one of the primary means through which we reflect. And of course, what we don't know at that moment is we are sort of inextricably, our attention is being drawn away from wholeness, sort of innate wholeness and innate completeness into this sort of, well, we, it starts out, I suppose, uh, with an attempt to be functional, a functional self that helps us na navigate life and yes. communicate what we need and don't need and what har harms us and what doesn't harm us and what we like and don't like. That's the good part of it. We all know the other side of it. Um, but in a certain sense, I think the, the moment that you did that, you were turning in, into, into a subjective experience of being and you found this lost little piece of you, yeah. this lost kid. It's literally like a, a piece of a body. Yeah, and is... it's exactly the same age as when you left him there. Yes. Right? And yes. that's the interesting thing. It was like thing. frozen, you know, the, uh, it's like um, uh, one of the beautiful, there's a beautiful fairy tale, uh, Snow Queen, by yeah. uh, Hans Christian Andersen, you know, the Kai, the boy Kai, who is uh, abducted by the Snow Queen, and he has to spell eternity, for all eternity, mm -hmm. and, you know, uh, he's frozen. And that boy was frozen inside. And I had to, in fact, at first it, is, it feels the, the, the actual experience can be described by saying that you find 
a, a dead, a dead bo a boy. I, 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 that's what I felt, that he's dead. And, and this is an incredibly um, sad uh, uh, moment. Mm -hmm. It's just gr you grieve for this lost uh, child. Mm -hmm. And at first, it, and, and, and this is why I think it is so difficult, or it, 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 we experience it as such a difficult moment, mm -hmm. is because the pain is ju can just feel unbearable, even to an adult. Mm -hmm. And what is important, uh, what I found, is that actually if you don't turn away, but you, you, you take him and hug yeah. and give him your warmth, he will come back. Yeah. And this is absolutely stunning. It's literally, you bring back somebody from the dead. Mm -hmm. And he, resurrect them. He is like Lazarus. <laughs> and he's like, I mean, I, I, I'm not being facetious, you know. It, it, this is what it felt. And, you know, it's been, uh, that particular experience has been three years. You can see my, uh, big, well, who is speaking right now? Yeah. It's the boy. It, it's still the boy. He's still, he's still uh, uh, excited about mm -hmm. that moment mm -hmm. that he came back and he wanted to tell his story. Mm -hmm. And it brings you more alive in present time, right? Alive, exactly. and your heart starts and, and this to is open. what I realized because, of course, the point is that once it happened, then I, I felt the urge to tell everybody about this, mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. and say you have to because also you start feeling the other boys and girls inside yeah. who are not getting the attention, mm -hmm. and they recognize that this guy has com is communicating with his boys, mm -hmm. so they say tell 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 them tell them. You know, I do. It's incredibly, um, <laughs> they're pushing, you know, they're pushing, like, no, oh, tell them, tell them. Mm -hmm. And so then at first, uh, the, the urge is just, you know, I, I, so I, I tell. And mm -hmm. then you find resistance mm -hmm. very often. Mm -hmm. Then understanding comes also with some maturity, I suppose, that everybody has their own path. Yeah. Everybody has their own. Their own timing. Their, their own well. timing. And you cannot push mm -hmm. because it actually could be, uh, have a negative effect. Mm -hmm. Because if they're not ready, first of all, they, they can erect even higher barriers. Mm -hmm. Or if they go plunge into that um, sorrow, you know, mm -hmm. they may not be equipped yet. Mm -hmm. so, so that came. But one of the things, one of the arguments which I, which I heard, especially from the non-dual community, mm -hmm. which I feel is important to discuss here about, uh, related to this, which I feel is really a misunderstanding. So there are certain things which cannot be conceptualized, but certain things can be conceptualized. And this, I think, is one of them. And what I'm talking about is this argument that, look, this was in the past. Mm -hmm. Therefore, it doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. The past is just an idea that we have at the present moment. Yes. There is no such thing as a past. There are only memories of the past. So there is no need to go there mm -hmm. because it's not there. And what I discovered is that actually, this is true, of course, for most of the life experiences. Mm -hmm. But certain special moments when we refuse to accept what is, mm -hmm. the reality of what is, mm -hmm. and instead try to replace it by um, a story. It's like almost, you know, like in those movies where the, there is a, a a bank heist, and, and, and then they replace the video uh, footage of you know, like the security, watching the yes. security cameras, and the people who come to rob the bank, then the first thing they do is they replace the video to a loop, which mm -hmm. is starting, starting to show something else so that they don't see that the, the people go and take the money, and they take the gold, and so on. You know? So it's like this, that uh, we start telling the story, but reality is always um, you know, you can't fight. You've said that many times. I've heard you say this many mm -hmm. times. But reality will always win over any story, in even the yes. most elaborate story. Yeah, yeah. Reality will always yeah. win. So resistance when, is futile. Hmm? Resistance is futile. That's right. Reality ultimately, always, ultimately, always wins out. Ultimately, ultimately. Right. But in the process, there's a lot of suffering, misery, etc. Right. Suffering. And so, but the point I'm trying to make is. So what it means, I think, and I think it's, again, it's a model, but it's, I think it's a pretty accurate statement, is that those moments actually we carry with us mm -hmm. in the now. It's not the past. Mm -hmm. That moment when I was failed as a 16-year-old boy uh, on bogus pretenses at Moscow University you know, in, 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 in the Soviet Union, which I talked about here in more detail three years ago, 
That moment was always with me. That boy was always with me for the simple reason that I never accepted. Mm -hmm. I never allowed that experience to go through me. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? Yeah, it gets frozen in you. If it Therefore, it gets frozen. You. Therefore, in fact, this argument that there is only now, the past does not exist, it doesn't mm -hmm. apply. Mm -hmm. Because for all intents and purposes, that experience is not in the past. It is in the now, actually. Well, there really isn't any such thing as past experience. Right. There's only... If you're, even right. if you're experiencing the past, you're only experiencing exactly. it in the present. But there is some special um, element yeah. to those experiences there is. which cause the splitting, the cause the association, yeah. the cause the uh, kind of like yes. forgetting those parts of ourselves. And you're bringing a, a really important point, because I, I think I see this misunderstanding too, as, and I think it's based on one fundamental principle that's often missed. And not missed often like, oops, I missed it, but like missed like, doing the very thing that you, you were talking about. Like, I don't, I, I don't, I don't even want to know that yes. because all hell might break loose if I let this other part in, right? If I, if I, so what I mean is there is that experience, that, that experience, that subject on the deepest experience of being. There, it, there, we bump into something that we would call and experience as timeless. There's no past, there's no future. And in one sense, there's not even the present. There's just sort of is. And so that's one dimension of being, the timeless dimension of being. No becoming, no evolution in a certain sense. And what I mean is not as a metaphysical truth, but just as a subjective reality. But also, it's like the front and back of your hand. And you flip over the other side of your hand, and you also have this very human domain where on the timeless domain, the nice, one of the beautiful things is you discover that the essence of you was never harmed, never hurt. But in the human domain, you flip it over, and it's like it's the same hand. And as a human being, you do get hurt. And you do go through experiences, and things do happen in time, and they do progress, and you can evolve, and you can regress. And, and it's very tempting when we have powerful transcendent moments, basically what we're doing is hopping out of one domain of experience into another, into the timeless. And the timeless feels like such a relief, it's so safe, it's so freeing, that we can unconsciously, and sometimes consciously, be using that domain of our experience as a defense against the very human part of our experience. That's right. And so it's interesting that, you know, and I think in like the, the, the obviously intellectual pursuits, not always, but at times, there's, there's the underbelly to sometimes what's fueling the, the living in the mind. And it's often something painful that's, you know, it's much easier to live in the mind. Yes. The interesting it's thing more, is... It feels more secure. Yeah. But what I've found, because I, I basically move in the domain of spir spiritual seekers, you might say, and most people are spiritual see seeking for kind of the same reason. Yes. Is there's, there's a lot of pain, and I really don't want to experience that, and I hope you can help me transcend it so it just disappears in a cloud of smoke. <laughs> and of course, you can, you can actually do that to some extent. You, you can transcend it, and it all seems to disappear, and it all seems to be gone. But, you know, it's like one of those trick birthday candles that you blow out. And then, and then there's like a three-second delay, and then it comes back right. on. And so, so it's a kind of a deferred payment. It's a deferred you payment. Get, you have to pay you, that at bill so, at one some way or another. Point, you have to, if, especially if we want to embody and live in our humanity, what we realize. Because when okay. we in deep moments of realization, we're kind of transcending our humanity. But to, to solve that issue, what people ask people like me all the time, how do I live in my life, what I experience in my deepest moments of being. Well, okay, you have to bring those two domains together, right? So you, you can't bring them together as, you're, as long as you're using the transcendent to hide from the human. The human mm -hmm. has to kind of, you know, clean the closet, clean out the old unconscious right, closet. Right. For, and there is a lot of other, other stuff in, in there, there in the closet as well, right? So I'm not saying that that's <laughs> yeah. the only... No, 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 it's, it's full. Right? So <laughs> you open it up and it just, you right. know, it's like... But 
<laughs> but I almost feel, and th this, I'm not sure about that, but I almost feel as though <laughs> those kids, those, those little ones, they also kind of almost, I want to say, hold the door to go further. Mm. That they say, uh, for instance, before I was able to connect, I had all kinds of ideas about reality. You mm -hmm. know, that uh, there's a Big Bang, you know, the standard um, stuff that you read on the science, uh, most of the science websites or whatever, you know. Uh, but basically, where consciousness comes from the brain and all this. I didn't, I never quite, I wasn't, I never quite believed that fully. But I had certain ideas. And um, interestingly enough, it was only after I was able to connect to at least some of those past experiences, trans transcendent experiences. And those little ones emerged from the land of the dead mm -hmm. to the, the land of the living. It's almost like they, they open the door and they say, look, mm -hmm. look, at this other, look at these other dimensions. Mm -hmm. But they were holding them mm -hmm. as, as though saying, first attend to my needs, first give me love, first give me warmth. Resurrect me. Yeah. Only then, through me, you right. will connect to those parts of reality yeah. which have been hidden. Yes, I think that's that. But there's uh, there's often a truth to that. I think that's a really, really insightful thing because to get to the deeper domains of reality, which is what I think so many people desire, right? You, you, you talk about emptiness, nobody's interested. You talk about unity, and all of a sudden, well, okay, everybody's mind perks up. You don't really get one without the other in the end, but nonetheless. But since, since, since unity is, if we take it out of all the abstract terms, the closest thing that I can come to it, it's, it's the deepest possible experience of in, an intimacy with all of existence. And when you start to open these little closed parts of you, they're like doorways to rediscovering intimacy. They may not initially, yes. you know, just open you to the intimacy of all existence, but it is opening the door of the heart, right? It is, open, it is starting to open the, the mechanism through which yes. you can perceive much deeper realities. Right. And you, if, you, if you do an end run around them, right. even if it's successful, it's generally going to be temporary. Right. And still, those dimensions, in my personal experience, would not be accessible. And it's clear why, because I had to severe, uh, basically cut off that part of myself, mm -hmm. which died in that moment when he was told that his dream of becoming a mathematician mm -hmm. was crushed. Mm -hmm. He was crushed because, you know, it's 1984 in the Soviet Union, like in uh, George Orwell's uh, novel. Uh, there was, it didn't look like there was any possibility for uh, little Edward uh, to uh, mm -hmm. become a mathematician to f f follow his dream. Mm -hmm. What is the point to go on living? You mm -hmm. know, so so that part, uh, that, that that part has died, and uh, it's only. Uh, but because I had to severe that connection, and I had to pretend that it never happened. So I actually had a story in my mind, all these years, 30 years, mm -hmm. 30 years, uh, until about three years ago. I was so strong and so confident in my abilities that it didn't really affect me, that experience, mm -hmm. you see. Mm -hmm. and, in, in, and, and in a sense, it was true, because I was able to succeed. Mm -hmm. I was, and in fact, that gave me, the, that boy was pushing because it, he wanted to come out, mm -hmm. and one of the ways he pushed the Edward, that, the part that survived, was to work harder, prove to those guys how good you are, mm -hmm. so that you become strong, and you come back mm -hmm. and release me. Yeah. You see, yeah, and because so, you do have to have a certain fortitude. To, that's right. To be to be willing to open. That's right. And so, but the in the meantime, because I severe the connection to the, to that little boy, and there were others as well, I also cannot experience life through the eyes of a child, so to speak. Mm -hmm. I lose that capacity to be vulnerable, yeah. to be spontaneous, to be authentic, to be to this kind of innocence mm -hmm. of a child. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's why I feel there is more to this. Obviously, there are many other aspects of our life experience when there is a, um, how shall we say, there is a, a kind of difficulty, mm -hmm. there is a splitting, something happens. It could happen in the, in the womb, in fact. Mm -hmm. We know that, and in fact, there are scientific studies, and so on. 
later in life as well. But child, Jung talked about this in very beautiful poetic terms, that, about the, the archetype of a divine child, mm -hmm. what it represents for us, whether we know it or not. It represents all of that, spontaneity, authenticity, vulnerability, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so if I am not aware of a little one, a very concrete little one in my, per in my life, then I lose that connection. That's yeah. archi archetypal You're disconnected from your, from your own innocence. And that so the certain dimension of the heart, mm -hmm. the heart is closed. At least some dimensions of the heart mm -hmm. are closed. And so... Which is not just an, an emotional closing. Exactly. It, it is that, but it's also a perceptual closing. Yes. And even at a deeper yes, level. Yes, but I'm not even aware what's going on because then situations happen in my life for instance, one of the things was that I became very um, anxious when I had to speak in public. Mm -hmm. And you know, I, I was very successful in what I did. So why? There was no reason mm -hmm. to be anxious. But of course, you know, there was a four and a half hour exam where these <laughs> this two men who were, you know, 20 years older than me uh, asked me questions which were far beyond the program, mm -hmm. etc. So th that I can see now very clearly how that affected me mm. in my adult life, but I wasn't aware of it. I didn't know why. I thought, I just have to train myself. I have to prepare more. I have to train, etc. Mm -hmm. It was only after that connection could be reestablished. I could con only after I could connect to that boy yeah. that suddenly these things start to fall off, yeah. that anxiety, that Another thing was, I would get very offended by, you know, sort of offhanded remarks, mm -hmm. and it would cause a lot of heartache and, and, <laughs> and heartbreaks, you know. Again, I was not aware. So that's what I mean when I say catch-22 situation, mm -hmm. because it's not something that can be um, done at the level of the mind, kind of. No, no, yeah, because that's not where the, the wounding is at the level of mind. It's, it's exactly. the level of heart and feeling and emotion and grief and pain. And yes. All. That's, yes. That's where it is. And like you're saying, it, the thing that I've always, the hardest thing for me to convey to, pe to, to people, especially when they come into like a spiritual domain and they're dealing with this big, these big, big, big questions, and I always try to get people to like, remember when you were a kid, a child, and you looked up at the sky, and you know, you wondered how far is those stars away? Right. And you didn't really want an adult to come in and say, well, Billy, it's 2.5 million light years. Because you go, what the hell okay. is that? Exactly. But you, see, the problem you is... You wanted to wonder, and I, I think the, the big existential questions are actually coming from a sure. very state of innocent, young he wants, wonderment. he or she wants to come out. Yeah. But for instance, in my case, I didn't even have those memories, for yeah. instance, because those memories may also be inex rendered all but inaccessible yeah, the curtain was by, by this kind of a splitting. So then the question is, how do we... Uh, so I wrote this article for AI researchers, mm -hmm. and I think it's very important that we talk about these issues. Mm -hmm. For instance, there is this idea which makes rounds now in this sort of scientific community. And these are my people, you know, I represent, I love them. And we are very in, the mi in our minds mm -hmm. for a reason, mm -hmm. I think, for a reason. Mm -hmm. And so, I, uh, one of the ideas is like this. Humans are so uh, horrible as a, as a species. Mm -hmm. The only good thing humans can do is create robots. <laughs> That's human's role in evolution, <laughs> create those robots, and then let those robots finally create a just society, and then perhaps just exterminate this terrible, terrible humans. Yeah, hopefully they'll behave better. <laughs> <laughs> or, or train them somehow. Yeah. You see, it is very, very common. It is very, very common. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's actually yeah. ironic, because sometimes you, there are documentary, documentary films about this. And there is this one film I, I watched about one of those researchers who is very um, adamant about these ideas mm -hmm. and very vocal about these ideas. But then they talk about his personal life where he treated in a terrible way mm -hmm. some of his colleagues mm -hmm. and friends. Mm -hmm. And when they ask him, what, what about, you say that humans as a race, as a, as a, as a species is horrible mm -hmm. and you have to exterminate. What about your personal, like, okay, forget about the big issue of like humans. Like, what about your personal life? What about yeah. you mistreating that person or that other person? And I say, oh no, but I don't want to dwell on this. You see what I mean? <laughs> so, and the point is, 
But the same, in some sense, happened to me. After I was able to make those connections, I saw how naive mm -hmm. and, frankly, vapid all these ideas that I had mm -hmm. in my mind about evolution, consciousness, reality, and so on. I had ideas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they were not maybe the worst, but in some sense, they were just kind of uh, so far away. And the reason, of course, that I did, it was a way, it was a frightened ego yeah. spinning out those stories as a way to avoid facing mm -hmm. reality, mm -hmm. finding out who I am, you see. Mm -hmm. So I wrote this in this article, which I'm actually still surprised that they're going to publish it. <laughs> <laughs> but then the editor, who is very sympathetic to this, is a really great guy, he asked me, but what is your advice? What suggestions? What are practical suggestions? Because that's how we think, right? So what are the practical suggestions? So then I said, look, practical suggestion is, number one, I think that our science courses, and especially computer science courses, mm -hmm. should include uh, courses in uh, psychology, where mm -hmm. at least this possibility of the dissociation is presented. Mm -hmm. Now, I, am, I have no illusion that somebody who is not willing to listen is not going, they will find a way to avoid it anyway. Of course. Right? However, there might be someone who is ready, mm -hmm. and that's how that connection will be made. Mm -hmm. So that was one advice. And the second advice was, we should also, t we scientists, should take matters in our, into our own hands and talk about our personal experiences, share at our meetings, so mm -hmm. put up some time aside where, and I feel that our stories have so many common elements mm -hmm. that when one speaks, others will follow. It often only takes one person to open the door. Yes, That's true. And so, so I'm writing all this, and then I thought, well, you know, science, of course, so this will probably take some long, a long time to really kind of try to change that and have those programs. But then I thought, well, spiritual community. Mm -hmm. Here, of course, we are science non-duality. So how come? And I said, well, I, never, I almost never hear this in, a, in our non-duality conferences or spiritual, mm -hmm. from our spiritual teachers. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering why. Mm -hmm. Because it seems to me, wouldn't that, wouldn't that be the, the place? It's the same. The reason why is the same reason why they don't talk about it in, in the scientific communities. It's just, there's just two different ways of avoiding. <laughs> right? Some you go into the mind, and some you go into the transcendent. And okay. then you don't let the other, you don't, you know, it's like, don't open that door. That's, on, on Dora's books. That, yeah, that one's messy. We don't, we don't want to talk. And, and in spirituality, we'll go so far as to say, that what's behind that door, it's not even real. It's a dream. Now, talking about a successful way of denying right. something, it, and there's a, you know, and that's what I found being a spiritual teacher and being in the community is, not that everybody does this, but wow, there's a lot of that going on. And so there can be a lot of fear and all the same things can go on. You know, spiritual personality types are not different at a certain level, we're all right. human beings, exactly. and we share the same fears and the same hopes and the same dreams and the same ways that we delude ourselves and hide from ourselves. And but but do you think rest. it's possible for a teacher, for a spiritual teacher like yourself, to bring up these kind of questions? And do you do that when sure. you teach? Yeah, yeah, I've done it a lot. I mean, it, it, it naturally comes up a lot, especially when I'm, like, say, doing a retreat. And I'm, and I'm doing like a two-hour dialogue session, which we already do is dialogue, you know, half, three-quarters of the questions sometimes are in this domain, you know, the real, what we would typically call, even though it's kind of boxing things, a sort of psychological domain, because, man, you can't sit there and, and introspect, even silently, for very long. It's, if you yes. get very deep at it, at some the point... The more you open up, the more those... The, those kids are starting to knock on the door. The suppression lid starts to come off, right? And it's, it's why even people that can have big sort of spiritual awakenings, and for a while I call it the spiritual honeymoon, you can think, okay, that's it. All my personal issues are dealt with, and I'm enlightened and all that stuff. But what you don't know has happened, you, what you find out is part of that awakening is the ability to suppress the lid that's locked on your unconscious has basically kind of been ripped open to some extent. Yes. You won't feel it. It might take weeks or months, sometimes a couple right. of years. But often people actually experience some of the most difficult, the most dark, painful, 
um, psychological challenges after they've had big spiritual shifts. Sure. Because then it becomes unavoidable. It's it becomes, sense. you would become you, more sensitive. You would it. think, but boy, do they try. Right. <laughs> the mind is very capable. It's, it's sure just, it is. It but, becomes harder, though, at a certain right. point. You know, the denial, um, right. it's amazing and, what and, it takes and, for denial to break down. And for sure, <laughs> the, and that's okay, too. Sure. Everybody has their we own all path. We have our own path. Right. My question, rather, is so I started out by saying that for me there was this special moment. Yeah. And the moment was that. I, I just wrote my book, and it was called, you know, Love and Math, Heart of Hidden Reality. So I was searching for hidden reality everywhere. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Where is it? <laughs> Where's the flashlight? And then finally, uh, life brought me in, in touch with a human being yeah. who said, Edward, you're right, there is hidden reality. Mm-hmm. But it's not outside. Right. It's inside you. Mm-hmm. And that was the moment when everything changed. And so... Mm-hmm. I wonder, for you personally, I'm curious, and I'm sorry to put you on the spot. Go but ahead. What was the moment for you? Was there a moment where that came, that realization? There was, some, there was a boy inside. Um, I, you know, I think I was, I was actually kind of connected to that stuff all along. I, I mean, I'm sure I did, you know, kind of standard amounts of suppression and things came up that were... But the thing that... I'll just share what comes up when you say that. In fact, I shared this story just a couple of days ago with somebody, and... Um, I grew up having sort of what I call a nice guy personality. And if you're going to have a, a phony sense of self to live with, that's a pretty good one. You know, it, it's positive, people like it, it's not like being the black sheep of the family or whatever. And so there I am having this, you know, I'm, I'm kind of the nice guy, you know, the guy that always listens and, you know, basically agrees with what people want them to agree with so he can be perceived as nice and helpful. <laughs> And so I'm driving down the road in a place not very long from here, a town that I now live in, Las Gatas. I'm literally driving my car. And almost like literally, and I'm not typically prone to these kind of things, but it almost sounded like the voice of God. It was almost like a voice that was to the right and up here. And it just said, you're a phony. And I'm driving the car. <laughs> and it was kind of a, of a quality that got my attention. You know, I didn't know where it came from. or what. It was like, whoa. And it kind of stunned me. And then it said, the only reason that you're so damn nice is, is so that you get perceived as being the nice guy. You're not nearly as compassionate and loving and not even as helpful as you think you are. And I'm just, and it hit me with such force. You know, I, I was like, my jaw could have come off the floor because it was one of those moments that you know, when you, you can't deny, you, you know that it's true. Absolutely know that it's true. And of course, the nice thing was, is there no, it wasn't another human being telling it to me. So like, who am I going to argue with, right? It just came. And that was sort of an, an opening and tearing the lid off of a sort of the, one of the central glues that held the whole persona together. And then I started to see, oh, what's holding it together isn't just you know, being nice and compassionate and loving. That's part of it. That was part of it, too. There was some nice stuff. But it was also, it was also a, an attempt to be viewed in a possible light. And, of course, underneath that is fear, right? Right. Oh, so, rejection of not being accepted by That's others. right. So there's but, always that, that fear. So that was one of, one of my moments. With, but that was that more was, of an adult, uh, an adult life. Um, that was more an adult life, but this thing had been constructed. But then you could see the connection along. of that. Oh, I could see it to right specific back to experiences as, in the absolutely mm. right back to you know almost as as young as I can uh, as I can remember being, and you know all the moments were. And so, in that sense, yeah. to really allow this sense of this need to be ni- to be seen as nice and so on, yeah. to allow that to fall off. Yeah. One would, I would imagine, you would need to connect to that, to the, to, to the child who had the, got this idea in the first place. Yeah, it was connected to the underlying, the underlying fear, fear, which was really what it was just which could come from specific, uh, specific circumstances. Could it come from specific circumstances? I, I didn't get one specific circumstance that was like, okay, this is the moment where, it, mm-hmm. where there was, you know, lots of little, little moments, like lots of little stars, kind of thing, and course, what I saw was what, I, what was, I was really being called to do was simply to basically, it was, so, it was kind of simple, mm. 
basically just experience that underlying fear of rejection and all the rest. Just experience it. Let yourself mm -hmm. have that experience. And as I was doing, and I was literally start, just did all this as I'm driving down the road, mm -hmm. you know, and you didn't need any special okay. circumstance. Yeah, it could be a dangerous, but... It, it could be. I don't <laughs> recommend it necessarily. <laughs> Um, but that's when our but as it was mind can get in a certain place when you yeah, drive. Which, there was a rediscovery of, yes, yes. of an innocence. Yes, yes. That's what came in as the fear was allowed to kind of just course through the body and all, all the rest. And what, what came was this uh, a, a newly discovered sort of um, an innocence, but also it was so interesting that I think when we get back to these kind of really innocent places, especially when we're adults, they're not we think of them as weak and vulnerable, but that's an association to what they might have been. Right. But there is a kind of, innocence has a kind of invulnerability mm. because... Because now you're strong and you, you actually know that you can protect yourself. Yeah, you can protect yourself and you can, you can have people not like you and it's not gonna kill you. Exactly, yes. And you don't have to worry about not getting what you need. And it's such a, such a weight that is, not is dropped, right? Oh, so it's like it's a, a relief. It's a relief, it's relief right? Off. It's a relief, sure. But you see, so I, this is always I, a part of any inner, inner experience, I think, of if, we're gonna, if it's authentic, that's going to include these kind of elements. Right. And so, but I think it's incredibly powerful when someone like you, uh, you know, it's like even Adyashanti felt that he's a nice guy and that he has a fear. I, I, you know, I remember you uh, 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 listening to some of these personal stories that you shared, for instance, uh, in various interviews mm -hmm. about how you were uh, uh, you know, pursuing uh, awakening for five years, a very, very stringent, stringent yeah. regimen of meditation, etc., and how there was this moment of breaking down, mm -hmm. which was, in fact, the moment of the opening. Mm -hmm. And it was incredibly powerful to me, uh, reading that or hearing it from mm -hmm. you at the time, so, do you, so my, my last question, we have a little <laughs> time, is do you think we should do more of that? Uh, do you think that, of course, you know, being a teacher, you know, also has its own, um, puts some restrictions and so on. Yeah. But I feel as though like, we are in a moment where we need to speak more about those difficulties and those traumatic, I would say, traumatic elements in our lives. Yeah. Would you agree with that? Yeah. And especially in the framework of uh, spiritual journey, spiritual search, because as you said earlier, in a sense, we come to these meetings, we come mm -hmm. to, um, we search for the truth, but actually a lot of that is longing also uh, yeah. to, for finding that, that yeah. missing child. And I think ha the, 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 we also need to acknowledge that, um, like, for years now, cer certain material that sometimes something will come up for somebody, and I'll just get a really clear sense that, oh, that person's going to need something more than us having a moment of communication. Um, and then I'll, I, I'll recommend people to therapists all the time. So I think that's also important is, is to realize that a spiritual teacher is not, has not, is not necessarily a skilled therapist. Right. Right. And we, of course, we, we, we need to have a, a certain working competency right. in that domain. And I think what we should be is, is, is open to it, but also open to the sense of the, one of the illusions that people have about spiritual teachers. It's kind of like if you've had some, some significant moment of awakening or you're enlightened or whatever people want to call it, then it means you're kind of good in all the domains or you know, you know the whole spectrum of being. Part of it, I think, is also, at least for spiritual teachers, is also to have a certain humility mm. and not think you have to play into that role of being an expert in absolutely every part of the human experience, because the truth of the matter is, you're not. You know what I mean? But a catalyst. You a can be a catalyst. Powerful catalyst. And, you, and you have to, it, there has to be a safe environment yes. where people can encounter whatever they do encounter. And I think that's where, if we just say, it's, it, it's a dream, or there's a kind of offhanded discounting of the more human parts of our experience, that becomes really counterproductive, because then we've kind of shut, we've enforced closing the door, sure. instead of going, So it's yeah. more like a catalyst, more like um, an invitation. An invitation, uh, yes. A teacher, I feel as though the spiritual teacher could offer an invitation to that kind of 
very concrete issues inside, which only you know about yourself or don't know, That's but right. may find out. Yeah. It's invitation. You don't have to take it now. If you don't take it now, it will come back. Yeah. But I feel that if I, as a mathematician, is put in a position to give such invitations, give out such invitations to fellow scientists, mm -hmm. then for sure, uh, spiritual teachers mm -hmm. would probably uh, should probably, not should, but could probably consider doing that <laughs> yes. at a more um, a kind of a, how should I say, at a, at a, at a stronger and a stronger and a stronger way. Yeah. You see what I mean? Yeah, I, absolutely. I do. I know, I do what you mean. I know we're about out of time, but some years ago I was in a sound studio in the Santa Cruz Mountains recording something for Sounds True, and we got it done in three days instead of five days. And right on the, and it came up and Tammy, who's the, the, the founder of Sounds True, goes, why don't you talk about unworthiness? And I said, well, what do you want me to say? She goes, I don't know. Just, just say something about it. Everybody I know feels unworthy, but maybe we should talk about it. So I kind of went back into the studio, you know, and I sit down and I ended up talking for two days. <laughs> on, you know, I, then I called it the core wound of unworthiness because for a long, long time I've always, one of my perceptions is the core psychological um, epidemic is, is the sense of unworthiness. It permeates Western culture for sure. I don't know about all yes. cultures, but it certainly permeates our culture. And is the source of a lot of aberrations that we see, for instance, political life, etc., things like that, right? Oh, it just, it, 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 well, when you, when you really start to see that, see through that one in yourself, mm -hmm. you, then you, you see it operating almost everywhere. And which is, it's not a cause for judgment of it. You yes. just go like, okay, I, I get that. Right, that's just... You see what's going on. Yeah, somehow. that's what is the process? What is the real process underneath, you yes. know, right? So, yeah. That's right. But, yeah. And that's where uh, words of wisdom from someone like you, for instance, the story that you shared uh, with us, I think, mm -hmm could really go a long way. Well, it's one of the reasons I, I generally share way more stories of difficult, challenging moments or failure than grand, beautiful, profound moments because they're actually better teachings. They're better. People don't need to know your stunning moments of victory. I mean, it, it's not, it might be interesting, but it doesn't help them. What usually helps them is sharing something that we know we can all have in common, which is our human vulnerability and fallibility and hopefully that whether you do it as a mathematician and open the door for for mathematicians or intellectuals to have a deeper connection or I do it as a spiritual teacher I think sometimes just doing that and even that alone it opens a per, it gives permission yes. and when somebody's ready yes they'll it, it'll it could be such a catalyst yeah yeah, it really can. So I just thank you so much, my friend. It's great you. to meet you. Thank you.